Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again to the research showcase today. I hope you're enjoying the delicious lunch that we have. Uh, we are all super excited to see all of you and have a chance to share some of the great research that is uh, happening in the Allen School. And for lunch, we actually have an exciting keynote talk today. Uh, the keynote talk is by Professor Hannah Hajishirzi. She's the Tarot Family Associate Professor here in the Allen School. She's also a Senior Research Manager at the Allen Institute for AI, which is very exciting to have this kind of dual position and have a chance to collaborate across the two institutions. Um, Hannah's research spans different areas in natural language processing and AI, focusing in particular on developing general purpose machine learning algorithms that can solve diverse NLP tasks. Uh, applications for these algorithms include uh, different things uh, such as question answering, representation learning, green AI, um, uh, knowledge extraction, and conversation dialogue. Uh, she has received many awards, including an NSF uh, Career Award, a Sloan Fellowship, an Intel Rising Star Faculty Award, an Allen Distinguished Investigator Award, uh, and also many different research faculty uh, awards from different organizations, as well as Best Paper Awards. So we're just super happy today to hear from Hannah about uh, today's talk on the science of large language models and language models for science. So thank you, Hannah, for being here. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Magda, for the introduction and inviting me for this keynote. Um, today, I would like to present our project on open large language models, OLMO, where we study the science of language models and also develop algorithms or language models to serve scientists. We have witnessed great progress in large language models over the past few years. These models nowadays create extremely fluent text, uh, conversation-like text, and also code, OK? And now they are being deployed in many end applications, in diverse range of applications. And everybody these days are talking about their impact on society, their risks, their economic impacts, and so on, OK? But what, where are we now as researchers in AI? Are we done? Not, because still there are many research challenges that need to be resolved. The, these models are computationally expensive. You still see they make factual errors or so-called hallucinations. Also, it's very hard to keep them up to date and also learn more about how we approach AI safety. But the challenge that we are facing these days is that all these state-of-the-art models nowadays are being developed by uh, private companies, and all of these models are proprietary. So it's very hard for AI researchers to actually understand and analyze what is going on behind uh, the, the doors in these large language models. We want to be able to build language models to scientifically analyze and understand the data and models, make sure that we can advance them. They are reproducible, and we can kind of follow the documents and then uh, replicate them. Also understand, when we say they are performing well, how can we access or assess the data leakage if there are some training and test uh, kind of, uh, uh, there are some test examples in training data. And when these language models are being controlled by some uh, private companies, it's actually really hard to make progress there. We argue that we need language models that are open. In fact, we want them to be transparent, reproducible, and accessible. Or as NSF Science Director put it, if we are an AI institute without having access to an open language model, it's as if an astronomer researching about solar system just by looking at pictures in newspaper. Different companies and institutes have different definitions of openness here. For example, OpenAI, Google, uh, and so on, they are releasing the API. The API is open. These days, uh, Meta, Falcon, uh, and Databricks, 
they have started to make models open to, for research purposes, but still, sometimes there are restricted access and not everything is being open, including the data that these models are being trained on. And also, there are not so much details about how the training code works. Here, we like to introduce Olmo and Dolma, where our goal is to make API models, data, and all the source code fully open such that it is reproducible and everything is transparent so, and share it with the research community and responsibly release it under appropriate licenses. Here I'd like to introduce Olmo, our open language model, where our goal is to study the science of language models, where Olmo is a full language modeling pipeline, where everything is open, we are documenting everything, and we want to make sure that things are reproducible. Through that, uh, we would have the full pipeline from pre-training to data curation, uh, to adaptation, evaluation, and also reinforcement learning through human feedback. And we would like to invite the rest of the AI researchers and AI community to help us improve it, like to help us understand and even advance these models. And then uh, together, we'll be able to narrow the gap between private and public sectors. Also, we are particularly focused on designing these language models, not just for AI scientists, but for scientists in other areas as well. Basically, through this, we like to advance scientific discovery and scientific understanding through other disciplines, such that, for example, mechanical engineers can bring their data in, we'll be able to fine tune uh, and train on those type of data. And then finally, our goal is to promote AI literacy through transparency and public demos. So here are the artifacts that we have released or about to release uh, in this year or early next year. We have open data, including the pre-training and demonstration data. We have all our training and inference code, our models at one billion and seven billion uh, scale size. Also the in inference code and code for instruction tuning. We have an evaluation suite to evaluate task performance and also the efficiency of the current models. And uh, we currently have internal demo, but we are hoping we can make it public uh, early next year. And we are working on improving these models through human feedback. And finally, we like to release all of this through our impact license, which is a license to release this data responsibly. Okay, so my talk today will dig a bit deeper into our pre-training data called DOLMA, adapting OLMO uh, to uh, a specific applications, and also some highlights about how our modeling, training, and evaluation works. Okay, so uh, as you might notice, this is a really big effort. And in all these projects, we have a long list of collaborators. So this is the paper that we have on our pre-training data. So what is DOLMA? We call it data for, to feed Olmo's appetite. It's a data set consisting of lots of text, in particular 3.1 trillion tokens. It is large scale and high quality. We have released toolkits that they transform the raw text that we have collected from web to uh, something that can be used as a pre-training corpus to train large language models. We have made sure to follow good design and kind of evaluated the performance when we were making design choices for our data curation. We have followed the common filters uh, when we wanted to transform our raw text, uh, including the duplication of this data. Also, as I mentioned multiple times, we've made it responsibly open through the impact license to avoid the, to, to, to make sure that we have risk medication strategies and it's not confusing to use. Okay. So how our data is distributed, it is mostly English at this point. It consists of a large collection of web data, in particular 2.6 trillion tokens in this data set uh, includes web data. We have enough code, like about 430 billion code, uh, 
Uh, and we've made sure it covers diverse domains, including Reddit, uh, knowledge sources, uh, and also science type data. To process this uh, data in order to transform it from raw text to this pre-training data set, we have made uh, quality filtering approaches, including uh, removing toxicity, removing personal uh, information, ident uh, like we've identified personal in information and removed it and so on. We've also deduplicated this text such that we do not include many repeated texts in this data and also decontaminated it, making sure that we do not have training test data leakage. So how does this data set compare with other data sets that are being used in the literature? I don't want you to go and read this table. I, this is the data sets that some of the closed large language models are trained on. I just want to show you that there are too many question marks here. And we basically have no, not much information about how these data look like, even how many tokens these uh, type of language models are being trained on. And in comparison with other open data sets that are being used for pre-training, our data is much, much larger. The previous larger data was almost a one trillion token. Okay, so here are some results. How did we collect and evaluate our current data set? Uh, in our experiments, uh, we have trained one billion parameter uh, 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 pre-training models. And here you are seeing our results on two data set, Hela, Soag, and Pika. And comparing our data, the green bars or the green curves, compared to two other available data sets, our uh, uh, numbers show higher in these two data sets. This data set has already been uh, impactful. Uh, it has been downloaded 320K times uh, in the past month. I think we've released it almost a month ago. Uh, we have about 1,200 authorized users. Our code repository has more than 200 stars, and it has been as a top trending data set uh, in the past two weeks, uh, just two weeks after its release in the hugging phase. Okay. Uh, now, let me move on to our next work stream, which is adapting language models to different applications. Again, this is a big team effort, and I'm thanking all these collaborators here. What do I mean by adapting pre-training language model? When you are looking at a pre-trained LLM, it's basically not useful directly for end applications, okay? Because they are being trained on next token predictions, okay? And this is just not aligned to follow human instructions. The regular, or our pipeline here is, we like to define new capabilities. In particular, we are focused on sciences. We want our model to be able to refuse not to respond uh, to un an, an inappropriate queries. Uh, also, we want our model to be able to verbalize uncertainty and also incorporate uh, tools and agents integrated with this language model. We have uh, started collecting instruction data and also human preference data, and we are following different strategies here, Annot data annotated by humans and also data that are synthetic and they can be extracted from other large language models. And we are looking at different approaches and also proposing novel approaches for instruction tuning and reinforcement learning from human feedback. So I'm using a few jargons here. Here in this talk, I'm gonna talk mostly about our instruction tuning approaches. Okay, what does it mean? The idea is we are taking a pre-trained large language model and we want to teach it how to follow instructions. This is called instruction tuning. How do we do that? Basically, we take a language model, we collect a bunch of demonstrations, like these are the type of instructions that a model would expect to receive, and then we want the model, we train the model here, uh, we call this instruction tuning, and now after this stage, the model is able to general, generalize to even new types of instructions. 
Last year, uh, my team focused a lot on this instruction tuning a, a problem, but mostly focusing on some tasks that were well known in the NLP community. For example, answering questions or summarizing text or classifying some documents if they are, uh, what is their sentiment, things like that. And we created two larger scale data sets this way called natural instructions and supernatural instructions that enabled instruction tuning in these type of NLP applications. Then we started uh, realize, kind of studying this phenomenon a bit more. We understood that there are three important factors for the success of instruction tuning. Data breadth, data depth, and data quality. We want to have a diverse uh, set of instruction, have high coverage. We want to introduce different skills such as coding and reasoning to these models. And also we want our data to be high quality. If you just look at NLP tasks, they are mostly limited to generate short text. But as you see, the state of the art in large language models now are able to ge generate really long text. If we look at human annotation to collect these higher quality data, then when we use them to, co to generate long text, it's very, uh, like either noisy or very expensive. So our idea here was uh, to introduce this approach of self-instruct, where we instruct our large language models to generate instructions themselves. We created this pipeline by initializing these language models with a, a, a small list of uh, about 200 seed tasks. And then we want these language models to generate new instruction type language given these seed instructions. And then we want them to generate the a specific input and also output like, okay, for this query, how do we think the output would look like? And then finally, we do a few filterings because throughout this process, we create some noisy data, right? So we put some thresholds, so I'm removing some details here, but through filtering, we created a better pool of tasks and then repeat this process multiple times. So this approach showed quite good uh, kind of promise in building better demonstration or instruction data and has been received really well by the community. In fact, many companies and universities started using our approach and created many different versions of LAMA-based model, which are all built on uh, Meta's language model, including Alpaca, uh, Bayes, uh, and many others. Uh, besides this, other companies also look at uh, creating human label data or also user shared data, for example, when they are interacting with ChatGPT. And then we are seeing throughout this process, we are seeing a lot of different claims uh, from the research community. For example, we saw a claim that Vicuna, which is this open source chatbot now, now gets about 90% accuracy to ChatGPT quality. But then there are some papers that, no, they are not actually this good. When we are looking at reasoning tasks, no, they are still far behind the proprietary model. So this was, like, uh, this was right on our agenda that like, we started this direction, so we want to study this more. Where are we here? And this was our effort to basically evaluate all these type of camel type models and see where we are in the open source instruction tuning uh, literature. Okay. So uh, we tried to cover all these data breadth, data depth, data quality. We looked at different data sets that either created by our team or other teams. And we evaluated six space language models, including Metas, uh, Falcon, like all these other open language models that exist in the literature, and also different types of instruction data. Um, and then finally, we combine all of them and build this new instruction tune model. It's called Tulu, which we claim it's the largest, best, and open instruction tune model at this point, which is trained on this diverse distilled uh, set of uh, demonstration data. Again, this has been received well within the community uh, with uh, more than 20K downloads, access requests, and code uh, kind of changes to the code. 
We've made sure to have this open in Strat GitHub, which we are constantly improving it. For example, if there are new data sets, they are, they are all being added to this repository. The initial uh, base model, the best one, was based on Llama 1. Then we have added support for Llama 2. We've also added different fine-tuning techniques, including parameter-efficient fine-tuning, such that people with lower resources can also use this model. Okay, so now, how do they compare uh, with current proprietary models at this point? We did three different types of evaluation, benchmark-based evaluation, GPT-4-based evaluation, and human eval. I, I don't show that giant table that we have in the table, but in the paper, but I want to highlight a few key points. One, different instruction data sets Basically, they introduce different capability for the models. For example, if we bring in chain of thought reasoning during training process, we see that our performance on reasoning data sets have gone up. If we include low quality data, like some of those automatically generated data, they might be actually hurting the performance. When we combine all these data sets together, we get the best overall performance, but there is an important uh, uh, however here. It is not the best across all those verticals that we were evaluating. So for example, for coding, it was not the best model there. So it, it uh, asks for this new research challenge, which is what is the best way to actually combine all these instruction tune models? Okay. Also, human evaluation confirmed our findings, showing that when we increased the size, we saw improved performance. This shows a comparison, like a head-to-head -head comparison between generated outputs for a given, uh, for, for the same instruction, for Tulu at 65 B size versus Tulu at 7 B size. And as you see here, in 45% of the cases, uh, human preferred the output from Tulu 65 B. And then finally, we did comparison with chat GPT output. Uh, we, are, we are lagging behind. So in almost 27% people preferred uh, Tulu 65B output versus 39% who preferred chat GPT output. But it is not too far yet. I, I'm still hopeful. Okay. So now, uh, with, the, with the Llama 2 model becoming available, we started to kind of put all these things together. Now we have better base model. We have a little bit better, a pro better training methodology. We included new data and also added scientific text. Um, so now our Tulu model is able to understand science text. Uh, here are our new results where I compare Tulu 270B a uh, purple bar with our initial version, the blue bar, and also Llama 2 chat that was the model, the chat-based model released by Meta. So interestingly, our Tulu 2 model is better compared to all, uh, the, the, to, to our earlier version and also even compared to Llama 2 chat. Um, and also for the purpose of uh, making these models useful for scientists, we evaluated on a group of scientific data sets, for example, answering questions about scientific papers, extracting information from scientific papers, and so on. And across all those, we are much better compared to Loma Tucci. Okay. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about our current stage of training, uh, uh, lang modeling and training and evaluation language models. And again, this is a big uh, collaboration uh, with a lot of our team members here. So just to mention a few highlights here, we have new training code that is uh, adaptable to both AMD GPUs and also NVIDIA GPUs. We have built this platform that we can run dozens of data ablations on Lumi, which is a supercomputer uh, in Finland uh, that includes a lot of AMD GPUs. Our 7B model is trained up to 1.5 trillion tokens. It is uh, the same kind of number of tokens as the first version of Llama. The training is still going. The current results, like we constantly evaluate our model, the current results are on par or better than other open models up to this stage when we are including these number of tokens. We have made progress in inference. Basically, now we are able to generate 16 tokens per second from one token per second 
um, and we are still improving these models. Okay, so a few important highlights that I wanna make about challenges and lessons that we've learned so far, which is uh, a lot of companies, like I wanna emphasize this again, a lot of companies claim that they have open language models, but they are not sharing a lot of details about their training. So we are going through this process again, document everything such that the next group doesn't uh, waste these many GPUs, hopefully. Uh, so we have some specific examples that even like there are some bugs, for example, in PyTorch uh, that we kind of uh, figured and uh, reported to, Py uh, to PyTorch people. Um, and again, training and optimization hyperparameters are not open source. And I'm not saying we are fully solving it, we are documenting it and we love everybody else collaborates with us and helps us. So we have a really good platform and setting to evaluate our models. Again, I'm copying that giant table there. It's not for you to read this, these numbers, but it tells us like through this uh, evaluation framework, we've incorporated downstream applications and also perplexity evaluation to show how good we are in terms of next token prediction. And we are doing in loop, like while we are training at every step, we evaluate if the training is going well or not. And then we are taking some checkpoints and then externally evaluate compared with other, other model. So we've made this pipeline such that our progress uh, now is more tangible. And just to show how we are doing at this point, uh, our current results are there, like train up to 1.5 tri trillion token, it, we are training towards all the way to three trillion token. And right now our average performances, which is like this giant table, like I, I look at them uh, with a magnifier most of the time, we are, like we are on par with Llama at this point. Okay, uh, so this project required a lot of compute. It still requires a lot of uh, GPUs and compute. We are partnering with AMD and Lumi, uh, Mosaic ML, for, uh, and Kempner, the the, an institute in Harvard. For data, we are uh, part and inference, we are partnering with Together AI, uh, and also for data with Surge AI. Um, yeah, and this is just repeating where we are getting the compute from AMD and Lumi. We are trying to make new partnership with Argonne National Lab, uh, and also we are seeking support from NSF through a research infrastructure grant. So just one, one line about the next uh, versions of Olmo. We love to continue this effort. We like to build multimodal Olmos, incorporate other images, uh, talk about bed, like the lessons that we are learning. We like to include it in our next versions. We are incorporating techniques of retrieval to solve the factuality errors. You will hear about this, uh, pr this in one of these kind of uh, sessions. Uh, we are uh, kind of doubling down on better scientific applications, how to include and learn from human feedback, uh, do more computational efficient approaches uh, such that the uh, communities with lower compute capabilities also able to use this type of models. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, one thing that concerns me about um, large data models and stuff like that, although I, I'm not really an expert in that at all, but it concerns me that we might be using output data from a, another language model into a new language model. And I'm wondering if that's going to deteriorate the information or the capability of future models as we use more information from like Reddit and stuff. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the question is asking, I think you're asking about the adaptation stage if we bring in the capabilities of other language models into these new models, right? Because pre-training data, everything is being uh, curated from scratch, like it's going from the web data, like these are not incorporating any other language model data. In adaptation through the distillation process or synthetic data generation, we are potentially incorporating data from other language models. But the point that we are incorporating them into generating new instructions where we have, uh, like the rumor says, OpenAI and 
these companies are using billions of dollars on data curation for these type of demonstrations. And especially for some of these models, it makes sense to actually distill this type of data from OpenAI uh, or other uh, hi highly accurate models at this point. Other questions? Hi, Hannah. Thank you for the talk. My name is Eric Ringer from Zillow.com. Um, a lot of the applications that we're building nowadays pair the language model with vector stores for so-called retrieval augmented generation. I'm curious, um, as you've been building the open models, to what degree does your instruction tuning make them better at retrieval augmented generation? And to what degree does that require a special kind of instruction tuning to maximize the performance of, of this particular behavior? That is an excellent question. Please attend the session, an NLP session. It's called, the, we have a paper presentation there, self-reg, where that's basically the same idea that you described. We like to do instruction tuning where we are aware of, like, we want to make sure retrieval is incorporated in that set. So how do we design those type of demonstration data with retrieval uh, for such that they are able to incorporate these knowledge sources? Uh, just to give you a quick highlight, the idea is we like to retrieve just when it is necessary, not all the time. Um, and for that reason, we are bringing in some checks and balances like, uh, if we, re if we need retrieval now, if we need retrieval, is this document, was this document relevant or not? If we created this response, do we think that the generated response is accurate enough or not? And then like through this full loop, we are able to show that we have improved accuracy at this point. Um, please attend the talk, so you'll, you'll listen there, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask, you know, it seems like every little bit, we have a new company or a new research come out with a new model on this new proprietary data set or whatever the case is. And it's only good enough for that amount of time until the next best one comes along. Do you see the landscape shifting to the point where you have this one model or I don't know, one company or whatever the case is, where we have a model that's able to kind of continuously scrape this new incoming data and does not need to keep being updated? Or do you think that with the newfound technology every little bit, we do have to continuously forever keep updating our models? Um, that's a very good question. I believe we need to improve our research to be able to keep these models up to date and don't start training from scratch. Uh, I don't think we have solved this problem in the research community. And again, I want to argue it's important to have open models such that AI researchers can also focus on these types of problems. Um, we have some intuition. We, we want to argue maybe we need to drastically change the kind, the way that we are designing language models nowadays uh, to be able to capture that, to make sure that they are 100% related relying on the data store, and keeping the data store updated is much easier than every time pre-training from scratch. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that that problem has solved yet. That's a very good question. But I, I, I can imagine, if, if you ask me, I would say in the next year or so, everybody is kind of just picking up, seeing what happens. Do we see saturation or we actually need to design new, uh, new models there? All right, well, th let's thank the speaker thank once you. again. Uh, so thank you all, and we invite you to slowly make your way to the afternoon sessions. Thanks.